Welcome back to Fly Fishing Hatches. I'm Raj Kletke, and in this part we'll mainly be tying flies for and discussing the common pre-emergent and emergent caddis hatch. We'll briefly review caddis also, but if you're not familiar with the terms that you see on this slide as they relate to caddis, please review all three parts referencing the caddis in my series on simple entomology for the fly tire and fly fisherman. These are possibly a little slow, possibly even boring, but they do have important information that you need to know to identify caddis and better understand how to fly fish the caddis hatches. They also have a little more detail on some of the fly tying that we'll do in this particular video. Whether the caddis larvae are free living, net spinning, or cased caddis, most if not all are potentially excellent for searching. Many may also be involved in the drift in adequate numbers to be considered a hatch by our current definition. While this may occur during behavioral drift, it may also occur when the glossosoma, which is known as the little brown shorthorn sedge, when its larvae en masse synchronously leave their turtle cases, which they outgrow to move and build a larger case. These hatches, if that's what we could call them, are hidden. Sometimes smarter fishermen than I may know how to recognize them, but I don't. I do use caddis larval patterns in searching mode a lot, however, so maybe I've lucked into a hidden hatch. There are variations that we'll mention later, but most of the caddis pre-emergent and emergent hatches that you'll be fishing follow what is the common mode. When the proper time comes, the caddis larva builds or uses a current case in which to pupate on the bottom of the stream. When pupation is complete, what we call the pupa, but is actually a ferret adult in a sheath, in other words, a fully formed adult in a sheath, leaves the case on the bottom of the stream, and after a variable time drifting near the bottom, gas forms between the ferret adult and the sheath. The gas together with the active swimming causes the pupa to rise to the subsurface where it will once again drift for a period of time before finishing the splitting of the pupa sheath and emerging as an adult on the surface. The adult may float briefly on the surface, but most adults fly away quickly, often in just seconds. Occasionally a caddis hatch may be quite obvious, but since the adult flies away quickly, more commonly, you'll see rising fish and wonder what they're taking. So how do we recognize a caddis hatch? You should suspect a caddis hatch if you see numerous rising fish without an obvious adult on the surface. While you should also consider spinners and midges when you see rising fish without obvious explanation, the caddis rise forms are usually much more aggressive than the sipping that trout make when taking midges or spinners. If present, spinners can usually be seen on the surface if you look closely for them. Also, midges and spinners will often be on flat, relatively slow water, while the caddis hatches may be on fast, riffled water as well as slower water. But the aggressive rise forms, sometimes even with trout coming completely out of the water, are often your first and best clue. If you look closely, most of the rises are swirls, bumps, etc., and don't leave bubbles on the surface. In other words, the trout are taking something mainly subsurface. And what are the fish taking? Well, it's the subsurface pupa, of course. They may also be taking emergers, but they're usually not taking adults. So where are the adults? Well, see the swooping swallows taking something out of the air above the stream? In fact, when you see birds swooping along and close to the stream, some emergence is usually taking place. Figure out what it is, and usually you'll have some good fishing. Let's tie some flies to fish the common caddis pre-emergent emergent hatch. In the simple entomology series on caddis, I did not tie the green butt, but since then I've had the opportunity opportunity to fish what we call the green butt hatch, as the natural pupa looked very similar. I believe it was a brachycentris, which is also known as a granum hatch, but several other species of caddis have very similar pupa, and it has become one of my favorite pupa patterns. 
I usually use a heavy hook, but I usually fish this subsurface, so a dry fly hook is also fine. I already have my thread on the hook. Note there's one eye's length of bare hook on the front of the hook. I'm using Antron yarn for the green butt, but dubbing would work fine also. Caddis do have a little thicker bodies than the skinny mayflies that we've tied in previous videos, so I'm tying a thicker butt here than what I would use for a mayfly. The green butt itself can be almost any length, but don't go over halfway. Tie off the butt, and then cut off the excess. Then tie in some silver wire on the near side for ribbing. I'll be reverse winding this ribbing, which is why I like it on the near side. After I have that in place, I take a couple of peacock curls that I'll put on top with a very small one. I'll use maybe only one peacock curl. With a 12 and above, I'll probably use three peacock curls. This is a 14, and I happen to be using two peacock curls. Once I have the peacock curls in place, I wind them forward to the small bare hook area that we left behind the eye. I'm not bothering to reinforce them with thread, as they will be reinforced with the ribbing. After tying off the peacock curl, I add extra wraps, and then I'll either cut or break off the excess. The extra wraps will unwind as you reverse wind the ribbing through the peacock curl. When you have that done, tie off the wire, and then either break it off or use an old scissors to cut it off. Don't use your good scissors to cut wire. Prepare your soft hackle. You can wrap a soft hackle in the usual fashion or use the distribution wrap, which you've seen me use many times. Here I'm using a distribution wrap, putting the fibers on the far side and letting the thread tension distribute the fibers around the fly. If you're not happy with the original distribution, start over. Otherwise, cut or break off the excess and put on a small head whip finish, and you're done. The green butt is quick, easy to tie, and has become my go-to pupa fly for most caddis fly hatches. Tie it in sizes 14 to 20, and you should be ready for most of the common caddis hatches. But I also like Gary LaFontaine's superficial sparkle pupa, although for me this is harder to tie. I Tie this in greater detail in my Simple Entomology series, but here's a quick review with the modifications that I use. I do start with a separate shuck rather than cutting it from the overbody later. On larger flies, 12s to 14s, I use a full Antron yarn doubled. I tie it near the back of the hook, toothbrush out the individual fibers, and then try to distribute these fibers around the hook. Then I put on the underbody. On small flies, I tie in one strand in the middle, toothbrush it out, and again try to distribute the fibers around the hook as I move back. Then I add the underbody. The key to neat overbody is getting a good distribution of the fibers around the back of the hook. Then pull the fibers forward over the underbody and put two wraps around the fibers in front of the underbody. With your left hand, hold up the bobbin so there's not weight on the thread, and try to push the fibers back to form a nice bubble. However, especially if you have a bad distribution at the back of the hook, the push method won't give a neat distribution. Rather than starting over, you'll need to distribute the fibers by picking them out and distributing them in small groups of fibers. Just pull the thread tight again, and then, I'm sorry, pull the yarn tight again, and then pick
pick out the yarn. Incidentally, the fish don't seem to mind a bad distribution, but if it's too bad, I don't like it, and so I won't fish it confidently. If things aren't going right, you can always pull the fibers tight again and start over. When you finally have the bubble acceptable, then add some more tight wraps to hold it in place and cut off the excess antron. Align the deer or elk hair ends in your sacker, measure for length, and tie them in on top. Here I pre-cut the hair, which I usually do because it is faster. I'll show how to make a little bit neater head and not pre-cut in the next video. Keep your fingers tight to the far side of the hook to prevent the hair from rolling around. Once you have the hair anchored in place, I stand up the head with a few thread wraps underneath before I whip finish and cut off the thread. I generally do not add extra material at the head as in the classical fly. While called a pupa, the pupa sheath is widely split and the wings are already out, so I consider it an emerger. Whatever it is, it works well during a caddis emergence. I do tie a separate deep sparkle pupa also, but I find I don't fish it very much. I prefer fishing close to the surface when possible. A slightly later stage emerger is the X caddis. I usually put on an antron or zelon shuck representing the clinging remaining fragments of the pupa sheath, an abdomen with color to match the caddis adult, and a slightly darker and I like spiky thorax, as the spikiness can also serve as leg imitations. The classic X caddis doesn't have a representation of legs, but if the spikiness is not adequate, I'll sometimes even add a couple of wraps of hackle to represent legs. Likely this doesn't make any difference to the fish, but I think it looks better, and as I always said, I will therefore fish it more confidently. I then add the wing in the standard fashion, basically the same as I just did on the sparkle pupa. Again, once it's tight in place, I usually lift the head up, put a few wraps of thread tight on the hook behind the eye, and then cut it off. I don't add extra material at the head like the X2 caddis. Except for the green butt, I didn't mention specific sizes or colors because these patterns can be tied in sizes and colors to match the caddis hatches that you'll fish. If you're starting your caddis fly collection, definitely start with tying sizes 14 to 18 in greens, as, greens and tans, as that will cover many of the caddis hatches you're likely to see. But be ready to add smaller and larger sizes and even browns and grays as you see the need or find specific caddis on your stream. But remember that many caddis species darken significantly within hours after they emerge. So generally, use lighter and brighter colors than on any adults that you find streamside. So, where's the elk hair caddis? We all know that's a great caddis pattern, isn't it? It certainly is, but put away your elk hair caddis briefly. We'll come back to it. We're fishing the most common caddis hatch mode, which is technically largely a pre-emergence hatch, but the trout will take partially emerged flies also. Remember that the adults fly away quickly. Even when adults are on the surface, they are relatively few in numbers compared to the subsurface pupa and the emergers, which are the most numerous and most vulnerable. I've had brown trout move three feet to take my X caddis after consistently ignoring my elk hair caddis of the same size during a fairly dense caddis hatch. The trout were also ignoring the few adults on the surface. I interpreted this as the trout ignoring the formed adults, which were 
going to quickly fly away, but were readily taking emergers which couldn't fly away and were therefore a much more stable and vulnerable target. So while I used to start with an Alcare Caddis and sometimes had some success, now for a Caddis pre-emergence and emergence hatch, I usually start with an X Caddis, which is a late stage emerger with a pupa dropper, most commonly the green butt or another soft hackle. I first try to fish these dead drift with quartering casts upstream in riffles and quartering down in flat water. For the X caddis, this makes sense, but pupas may be quite active and motion may be a trigger, trigger for the trout. Before I get into wildly changing patterns, I will swing this setup in a wet fly fashion with quartering downstream casts, having the green butt ascend at the end of the swing, and even try stripping in line on the swing and at the end of the swing, especially if I'm fishing slower water. This motion should present the green butt to advantage, but it should be a poor presentation for the X caddis. However, I've caught fish on both these flies during this motion. I guess theory only goes so far. If fish are continuing to rise and I'm not doing any good, I'll change to a sparkle done as a dropper. I like to change to a single fly once I know what pattern is working best. If you're not having luck, as always, check your positioning, your casting, size and length of tippet, size of flies. Consider variations of a caddis hatch, which we'll discuss in the next slide, and also see the previous Mayfly video for additional considerations of what changes to consider if you're not having luck during a hatch. Some caddis do not follow the common mode of pre-emergence and emergence. These variations usually have the advantage to the caddis adults that they can quickly make it to the relative safety of the streamside vegetation with only minimally exposing themselves to the birds. I've not fished these variations, but this is how I think I would fish them. For this particular variation, you would have to recognize it by timing, knowing that a caddis hatch should be happening. You may see a few birds taking something out of the air. These pupa can be very quick swimmers and runners. I'd cast quartering downstream and swing a deep pupa or weighted soft hackle towards shore near the bottom, even stripping it, especially if I'm in quiet water. With this variation, you're likely to see swirls and bulges of active, aggressive subsurface takes. Again, these pupa are strong swimmers, and I'd cast quartering downstream and swing a subsurface pupa pattern towards shore, again, possibly with stripping. With this variation, you'd likely see active, aggressive takes off the surface. You may not even recognize the scampering adults, but you might see small wakes. I would skitter a brushy Alcare caddis on the surface or some other brushy fly that I could cause a small wake without sinking the fly. I'm even thinking of trying a large Griffith's gnat or, or maybe even a crackleback sometime if I get the opportunity. So, skittering an Alcare caddis during a caddis hatch when the adults are running across the surface makes sense because the motion is probably the strong trigger, but that doesn't explain my limited success when I used to fish an Alcare caddis during this hatch. I suspect some trout do take adults during the hatch, and perhaps the Alcare caddis represents more than just a fully formed adult, but I think there's more to it than that. Many caddis that emerged a day or so before return to lay their eggs, and often this is during the same time as the new emergence. For the surfaced egg layers, an Alcare caddis is a good imitation. Perhaps I was actually fishing a post-emergence egg-laying hatch that was happening at the same time. So, join us next time when we'll discuss the post-emergence caddis hatches, and we'll tie appropriate flies for those hatches. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.